Rafael Palaio from uh, Stanford University. Dr. Palaio is a professor of psychiatry and sleep medicine, and he's here to tell us all about sleep in this population. Dr. Palaio. Thank you. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Um, are they clapping louder in that overflow room? Do you guys know? Anybody know? <laughs> I can't what's happening over there. Good morning. Um, I'm Rafael Pelé. I'm, I'm a sleep doctor at uh, Stanford. And thank you so much for the invitation. R really happy to be here. You guys can come on in. Uh, I am a professor now in the department of psychiatry, but I'm not a psychiatrist. I wanted to be a psychiatrist when I was in uh, high school and college, but I ended up, when I got to medical school, switching to neurology, and I switched to child neurology, just as a pathway to get into sleep. My interest is always, especially the first week of medical school, I started hanging around the sleep lab, and that's what I've been doing. And I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about sleep. Everybody sleeps. You know, when I walked in this morning, I saw the overflow room, so say hi, hi to you guys over there, and it was packed. It was packed. There's nowhere to sit over there. And I think, wow, this room must really be full. And I walked in here and I said, whoa, there's all these empty seats over here now. So our overflow friends could come over here if they wanted to, right? Um, I teach a class on campus called Sleep and Dreams, uh, set up by Dr. Willem de Ment, 1970. And Dr. Ment is now retired, so I get to teach the class. And yesterday, no, Wednesday was our last day of class. We have finals this week. But one of the things that happens at our class is if you fall asleep during one of our lectures, we'll squirt you with water, and uh, with a water gun, and you get bonus points. You actually can get bonus points for falling asleep in class. Uh, so I didn't bring a water gun with me, but it brings up the issue whether somebody falls asleep in class. And it turned out that when I did the math, when I took over the course, that if you fell asleep at every single class, you can end up with a C. So we had to like stop doing that. We had to cap the bonus points. Um, I have um, disclosure. I do consulting with a couple of different companies, and they're listed there. Uh, none of these are going to be relevant to our talk today, I believe. But if something comes up, I'll flag it. But I don't think any of these would be relevant to it. So we'll talk about overall sleep disorders. I mentioned I trained in child neurology, but I mostly take care of adult patients. And what I actually do is uh, I th what I think of as more like family sleep medicine. Because if one person doesn't sleep well, it affects the entire family. It's unusual to have just one person sleep poorly and everybody else, like, it's okay. Everybody, it affects everybody in the family, someone doesn't sleep well. And also these sleep disorders are familial. I'll show you a, a few of them, but sleep disorders are familial. So it's, if you see a child with a sleep problem, you're going to find parents with sleep problems. And if you see an adult with a sleep problem, you should ask about their kids, their relatives. Almost all of the sleep disorders that we're going to address today are familial. So what do we see in clinic? These are the typical conditions we see. We have a little bit less than an hour to talk to you about these. Each one of these can be a lecture unto itself. We have a Q&A afterwards. Insomnia, show falling asleep or staying asleep to the point it bothers the next day. It's probably one of the more common things that you'll deal with with adults and children with disabilities. Sleep apnea is, it's, it's like, I always say it's like fog. It gets into everything. You, you gotta take care of it. It's like sand on the beach. If you don't take care of the sleep apnea, it's hard to take care of these other things that you'll have. And many times you'll encounter patients who have tried some type of behavioral treatment or tried some medication to help their sleep, and they say it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work was is there was an underlying sleep apnea condition that hadn't been addressed. So you gotta clean that up first, and then you can retry things that supposedly had failed in the past. Now you might find that they do work. Parasomnias are things that go bump in the night. If I, if I give a talk at a high school or college, parasomnia is what the kids wanna talk about. They wanna talk about lucid dreaming. They wanna talk about sleep paralysis. They wanna talk about sleepwalking. Those are things that interest them. Restless leg syndrome, extremely common condition. Somebody in this room must have it. It's impossible to have that, this many people in the room and nobody have restless leg syndrome. Some, somebody must have restless legs. Yes, thank you. You have a couple of people raise their hands. Yeah, one of, one, you're one of the speakers, weren't you? No? Hi. <laughs> that explains a lot. I see you were like kind of moving around and stuff. I was watching you. I see. <laughs> Got it. Okay. We thought it was just energy. Um, restless legs runs in families. And I'll tell you my youngest case. Well, restless legs, first of all, I should describe it to you. It's an um, unpleasant sensation, hard to describe, with an urge to move. Characterized by an urge to move. First described over 600 years ago by Sir, I forgot his first name, Sir Willis, the guy who did the Circle of Willis. That same guy described restless leg syndrome as a neurological condition. Before then, it was thought to be a curse. 
And it feels like a curse to a lot of people because it's a condition where it only bothers you when you stop working. As long as you're moving around, it doesn't bother you. When you sit still, it'll come on. And I can tell you my youngest case that I saw was a two-year-old girl adopted from China. And restless legs is tied into iron metabolism. And these, these you know, wonderful parents, I mean, I don't have to tell you how generous somebody must be to adopt a child. Right? Amazing heart these people have to adopt a child. And they adopted this little girl from China when they said that she doesn't sleep well. And obviously people say, well, did you try sleeping with her? Is it neglect? Is she just stressed out by being adopted? And the parents said, no, we'll sleep with her. And a common question, something you can think about yourself when you in interact with, especially with, with younger children, if they have poor sleep, you can ask, does the problem get better or worse or stay the same if they sleep with the parents or their caretakers? And usually if it's a behavioral issue, if they sleep with the parents, it gets better. Right? Little kids usually want to be with, the, with people that, that love them and protect them. But this little girl slept just as poorly with the parents, in fact, with the adopted parents. In fact, I said, we wish she'd sleep with us. It was an Asian family. He said, we like to sleep with her. It's in our culture. But we can't sleep with her. She moves too much. So I said, you know, there's not many other things it could be in the differential diagnosis. So I said, let's just give her um, a little bit of iron. Let's, let's see if she has, um, we measured a ferritin. It turns out that she has restless legs. And the parents said she got much better quickly after, after we treated her. I think we gave her a low dose of, of um, Promipexil, which we can talk about later as a medication. But the interesting thing is when she learned to speak English, her first word in English was itchy. Okay. Her first because she would say itchy. She knew what she had. So rest of leg, something to think about. And when you see it in uh, kids, always ask about the parents. And you have to always ask that kind of semi-awkward question to, the, to, the, to the, whoever brings them in, the mother, uh, are you the birth mother? Because rest of legs typically flares during pregnancy. And you'll meet women who'll tell you that they know they're pregnant. They know to check for pregnancy because they start feeling the eggs, the legs start bothering them. That's restless legs. Delayed sleep phase syndrome, second most common sleep disorder among uh, young adults and teenagers. The most common simply being behaviorally induced insufficient sleep syndrome. People who just don't get enough sleep for, for their own reasons, which is very weird, by the way. Animals don't do that. Animals don't just stay awake for the, for the fun of it, usually. Usually they sleep on a rhythm. But delayed sleep phase syndrome characterized by difficulty falling asleep rather than staying asleep. If you've never made the diagnosis, it's because you've missed it. It's just that common. Look it up, learn it, you're going to start seeing it. Delayed sleep phase syndrome characterized by difficulty falling asleep, not staying asleep. Most of the time you talk with an adult with uh, insomnia or sleep problems, they say things like, Doc, I have no trouble falling asleep, I have trouble staying asleep. This is the opposite. I have trouble falling asleep, but once I fall asleep, I'm just fine. Interestingly, delayed sleep phase syndrome was first described in 1981 at Montefiore Hospital, um, New York City, where I trained a few years later. And it was described among a group of young adults who had what was called at that point atypical depression. What was atypical about their depression was well, the insomnia pattern was different. They had trouble falling asleep, not staying asleep, and didn't have the other feature sometimes of depression called terminal insomnia, which is a bad term, terminal insomnia, which means trouble falling, uh, insomnia at the early morning hours. But the other thing about these uh, individuals, these young individuals, was that they did not uh, respond to medication. None of the antidepressants at the time seemed to make any difference to them. Once it was identified as a circadian sleep disorder, and it was the first circadian sleep disorder ever identified, we, they reset their sleep schedules. And once that happened, their sleep normalized, and they felt better, and the mood improved. I'm always happy to come to this meeting, and I mentioned it to you earlier. When I was a medical student, I got to do a project on delayed sleep phase syndrome. And it wasn't that good a project, but I, but I wrote my project on it. We submitted it to the Journal of Pediatrics. And the letter of rejection was signed by Lucy Crane. So I was very proud of her. <laughs> <laughs> so when I saw her. And it wasn't, really re it wasn't really rejected. It was like, this needs more work. And she was right. But I was a fourth year medical student. And on the, before, it was before the Bell Commission. So I had the 110 hour work week. So I just never got to it. So it always would bother me that I didn't do it. But then I reconciled. I'm 56 now. I was 25 years old at the time. So I'm OK with it now. So, so, but it was a good thing. I think it was a good rejection. It pointed me in the right, the right direction where I have to be. Yeah, well, much more. No, no, you are thanked I, I grew with gratitude because it helped me think about how I want to do things and, and how it goes. But anyway, that's the late sleep phase syndrome. So learn that condition. My child won't sleep. My child is tired. Wouldn't it be nice if we can have kids sleep whenever we wanted to? Wouldn't it be so cool? Right? Can you imagine if you could have them fall asleep on demand? You can feed them whenever you want. Why can't you make them sleep whenever you want? Why can't we do that? Parents would love it. 
right? When you travel, wouldn't it be convenient if you could make them sleep whenever you wanted to? And actually, this is one of the reasons kids get medicated, is because it's inconvenient when they're awake. So a lot of times when some, <laughs> it's true. It's true. Wouldn't you like them to sleep when you wanted to? It'd be nice. And that's, what, that's when people will, will give the kids medication. So what goes through your mind when you hear this? How do you go through this? So we're going to touch on some of these issues. And what I like, one of the things, nice things about sleep is the principles of sleep medicine apply equally to children and adults. They really do apply across the board. And the same concepts that I use with adults, I apply to children, and it goes in both directions. And then we can talk some more uh, as, as we go on. Your life is reflected in your sleep, your sleep's reflection of your life. That's our symbol in sleep medicine, that yin and yang symbol. That's our official symbol. It's what I keep on my, my work ID. You see, I have it here. I have a little, if you can see it up front. See, that's what I keep on my thing. And in sleep medicine early on, they, they knew they couldn't separate the mind from the brain. It kind of goes together. The day and the night, it's just part of the whole thing. So uh, because of that's our symbol, it, it's like, a, it's a platitude, but I started saying this all, routinely when I give lectures to my students. Your life's reflected in your sleep, your sleep reflected in your life. And then what turned out to happen was, that got started picked up by, one of the students put it on a blog, and it got picked up by another blog, and I was carried on. And now, I was at a conference in Houston, and some lady walked over to me and says, I quoted you in a talk. He says, You're, that's one of the most famous sleep quotes out there, she said. So if you look up my, my name in uh, quotes, this shows up along with the Dalai Lama and Benjamin Franklin as a sleep quote. It's ridiculous. And then, <laughs> I'm not kidding, just look it up. You know, so some of you are just browsing the internet as they speak anyway, probably in that overflow room, that's what they're doing. <laughs> But um, uh, one time, somebody showed up with a picture of a mattress store in Lebanon. And there was that quote with my name beneath it in this mattress store in Lebanon. So <laughs> just use it. Just take it. You can have it. But that's a true quote. And that's the power of our students, the power of, of the echo chamber of the internet, how it carries on. The other phrase I like to say is that your sleep is biological. Uh, sleep is biological, but the way you sleep is learned. You've all been taught how to sleep. Whenever you interact with anybody's sleep, all sleep problems have four components to them. Child or adult, all sleep, components, all sleep problems have four components to them. When you get your history, you want to think about the amount of sleep, the quality of their sleep, the timing of their sleep, and what do you think the fourth one is, guys? Your state of mind. Get a sense from your, from your patient, from whoever you're dealing with, are they looking forward to sleeping? Or are they looking forward to being awake? Does it matter to them if they make it on time to their day program or not? They may not care. Sometimes the concerns are more of the caretakers than of the actual patient if they get up on time. Do you look forward to sleeping? You know, people with sleep problems talk a certain way that nobody else uh, talks. They say things like, um, I try to go to sleep. Nobody else talks that way. Everybody says, I go to sleep. They say, I try to sleep. Right? If I'm lucky, I'll get six hours of sleep. And they imply luck like it's an external thing, like sleep is out of their control. And when you start thinking that way, you know there's a problem. So you've got to get a sense from anybody you're talking to, are they looking forward to sleeping? When you deal with young, with young adults, or especially with teenagers, ask them who goes to sleep first, you or your parents. You'd be surprised how many teenagers stay awake past their parents. They may go to their bedrooms much earlier than their parents, and the kids do something that's very unadult-like. They convert their bedrooms to mini studio apartments, and they hang out in that room. So when you talk with them, say, get a sense, do you spend more hours awake than sleeping in your bedroom? You think that's not a good thing to do if you're spending so much time awake in the bedroom, but a lot of kids will do that. And then the kids will start sleeping in on weekends. That's the first evidence of, of poor sleep is sleeping in on weekends. Right? Okay, that's, a very un, that's a very unadult thing that they'll do. You may, as an adult, sleep in one or two hours. You don't sleep in five or six hours typically on Friday compared to Saturday. And the weekends is an artificial thing. Seven and eight-year-olds don't sleep in. Parents wish they would, but they don't. <laughs> right? They don't. They don't have to. They're sleep satiated. They're sleep deprived, and that's why they're sleeping in. And parents think, well, poor kid, it's good for him to catch up on his sleep. We don't do that with food, do we? We don't say, hey, we're going to starve you Monday through Friday. <laughs> Saturday and Sunday, eat all you like, because I'm starving you again starting Monday. <laughs> don't do that. But that's how it happens with our kids. The need for sleep is biological, the way sleep is learned. Just know this, with adults, all of you, the first night you spend with your loved one, your, that person you love, your significant other, the first night you were with that person, you got one side of the bed, that person took the other side of the bed. It was never discussed again after that. That was your side, and that was your side. When you travel, that's your side, it's the other person's side. You never ever change sides again. I've learned until much later in life. 
Older folks will have an agreement that one of them sleeps closer to the bathroom. So if they're, if they're in a hotel and the room is rearranged, that's the only time they change sides of the bed because they don't want to walk around the things. Other than that, that's your side of the bed. And if you don't believe me that sleep is learned and you sleep alone, sleep, you rotate your body and put your feet where your pillow go and see how you feel. You may fall out of bed if you do that. Same room, same everything, right? So sleeping is a learned behavior. We teach kids how to sleep. We teach them where they're going to be sleeping. That's an important thing. Talk to little kids. They talk to you about where they're going to sleep and what's going to happen. Little kids know in the dark. They know which side of the bed mom's on, which side of the bed dad's on. They know. If, if you speak where the mom says, my, my kid comes in and wakes me up at night. I'm like, well, why doesn't they wake up dad? Oh, because dad ignores them. I'm like, well, maybe that's the problem then, right? That's the issue. Why does the kid go to your side and not the dad's side? What's going on? He knows he can sneak in on my side, not on dad's side. The kids, I figured this out too. Corollary to this is what wakes you up and everyone's keeping you awake. There's too many sleep disorders. Sleeping is just something that we all do so much of. You should not assume that what's waking you up is keeping you awake. You may wake up because you have a little bit of sleep apnea, and that wakes you up. You may wake up because you have a little bit of reflux, a ton of reflux in our patient population. That will wake you up. But staying awake is something different. What's keeping you awake? Right? You're concerned about things, worried about things. So you always got to think a sense of people's state of mind and what's waking them up. We always talk about these sleep stages, and there's a few things I'd like to point out to you. First of all, John's in the back. Is it John? Thank you. John cleaned up my slides. Uh, I've had a problem with this slide for a long time, and he fixed it for me very quickly, so thank you, John. Um, so you just make these graphics pop. Thank you. Thank you. The, um, what he changed was, we used to talk about s sleep was divided into, well, take a step back. Our entire lives, you've either been awake, you've been dreaming or sleeping but not dreaming. That's all we do. We are awake, you're dreaming or sleeping but not dreaming. And those are the three states the brain seems to function in. So we, we talk about awake, dreaming sleep. You may know it's equated with rapid eye movement sleep, REM sleep. REM sleep was, uh, the term was coined by what, Dr. William DeMent. Dr. DeMent is, is alive. He wants people to know he's still alive. He's 90 years old. And if you ever want to visit him, he's open to visitors. Just come on down to the campus. He's well, happy to talk to you. Uh, he's around. He's a great guy. But anyway, he was into dreaming. Coming out of World War II, was, uh, uh, the big rage in psychiatry was Freud and psychoanalysis. He was interested in dreaming, so he talked about rapid eye movement sleep. And he didn't want to. He was a two-finger typist, so he called it REM. That's how that's how that happened. And then, since he was interested in dreaming, he he called everything else non-REM, non-REM, NREM, and they're kind of kind of they're disrespectful to the rest of sleep. But that's how it turned out. So we talk about awake, REM, and non-REM sleep. And non-REM sleep, we divide into a light, intermediate, or a deeper state of sleep. The deep sleep is also called slow wave sleep. And people often talk to you about slow wave sleep. And slow wave sleep used to be divided into stages three and four. Stage four got dropped as a term. That's one of the things that got cleaned up there. Now we just talk about stage three. Now, I described to you how we think of sleep as light, deep, light intermediate, and deep sleep, and talk about REM sleep. But the people you talk to, your patients, your patients' families, they may use the terms differently than you. A lot of people equate deep sleep with dreaming. That's how you think of it. And dreaming sleep is one thing, and delta sleep or slow wave sleep or deep sleep is something different. Slow wave sleep, deep sleep, maybe 10% of the night. It's when growth hormone occur, uh, secretion occurs, when physical growth occurs. And deep sleep is delta sleep, excuse me, is our deepest sleep. That's when it's hardest to wake somebody up. Underwriters laboratories have measured this. In deep sleep and delta sleep, you cannot wake up a, um, a teenager. They'll sleep through the, sm the smoke alarm. You cannot count on them. So whoever you're taking care of people in your lives, if they're in deep sleep, delta sleep, you cannot count on them waking up on their own. Deep sleep dominates the last, uh, the, excuse me, the first third of the night. And also, there are certain sleep conditions that occur at that point. Most of the parasomnias, things that go bump in the night, the things that we talk about with uh, young adults and children, as far as parasomnias, like sleepwalking, confusional arousal, sleep terrors, those things occur in the first third of the night. And parents say they can kind of measure it. With, uh, can measure it. If you think somebody's having sleep terrors in the last third of the night, it's more likely to be a par uh, partial complex seizure than an actual true parasomnia. And that's a differential diagnosis to keep in mind. And you can have both. You can have seizures and sleep terrors of the same person, but the timing kind of predicts how, how they're going to be. So that's slow wave sleep. Bulk of sleep is now st is stage two. The bulk of sleep is stage two. Now we think stage two is something to do with memory consolidation and memory processing. So important stuff happening, we think, in, in the formation of memories. 
The type of sleep that's often ignored in most conversations is stage one. It's very, people don't care about stage one. It's a light sleep. In fact, a lot of the apps, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of technology companies that are trying to hack sleep to increase your slow wave sleep, make your sleep even deeper. Um, just think of the uh, monetary value that would occur if any of these companies could show up with a device or a product or a pill that you could take that'll tell you, hey, if you take this, you're going to feel like you slept eight hours, but you only need to sleep four. In four hours, you're going to get eight hours worth of sleep. How many of you would try it? Look at you guys. How many raise your hands? You. You, you did it. Just, okay. We didn't say your hair would fall out. Nobody has the side effects. Like, I don't care. <laughs> Boom. I'll take it. Whatever it is. It's crazy. You don't care, sir, right? Right. Something else could fall off instead, sir. You would still do it, apparently. <laughs> but that's the thing. They want to... They and, and the concept behind that is the concept that sleep is an inconvenience. And we want people to think of sleep not as inconvenience, but sleep as a cornerstone of your health. Nutrition, exercise, and sleep. What could be, sleep is, the, is for the brain. It's not the kidneys that have to sleep. It's not our lungs that sleep. It's our brain that has to sleep. It's a restorative process. It's the most dangerous thing the brain can do, actually, is sleep. So whatever sleep's uh, function, one of the earliest sleep scientists said, if sleep has no function, it's the biggest mistake evolution ever made. But let me talk to you about stage one just a little bit. You'll watch around the room, look around, you'll see somebody at some point this afternoon after lunch. Head starts to roll, head nod, eyes roll, <laughs> boom, head drops. If you nudge that person, what's the first thing they say to you? I'm awake. <laughs> I'm resting my eyes. That's stage one sleep. Stage one sleep is characterized by thinking you're awake when in fact you're asleep. That is a true, that's a true thing. Stage one sleep is characterized by thinking you're awake when in fact you're asleep. Think of the power of that. You can do anything automatic, anything overlearned in stage one sleep. You can drive your car in stage one sleep. You can eat in stage one sleep. You can have sex in stage one. You can do all these things. Anything goes in stage one, so it's automatic behavior. And this will happen a lot with um, your patients, you talk with them. You ask them, do you take naps? And they'll take offense. No, I never take a nap. Like, well, what do you do after lunch? Oh, I rest. All right, I watch TV, right? And they, that's, you're going to get a sense of them. But don't, there's no point in arguing. Just know that if somebody's in a light sleep, they'll, they'll think they're awake. It's part of the situation that they're in. And if somebody's got chronic pain, if somebody's uncomfortable, any kind of sleep disturbance you can think of, that fragments, that makes their sleep choppy, they go back to stage one, and they go back and forth, stage one to the other stages. So they will tell you things like, I have not slept a wink. And you've seen them sleeping, but they'll say, I have not slept at all, because they did not perceive that, that sleep. It's unrefreshing to them. That's stage one sleep. REM sleep is kind of the juicy part of sleep that we always think about associated with dreaming. That dominates the last third of the night. As the night goes on, your dreams get longer and longer, more vivid, more intense. Now, how many of you have ever told somebody or heard somebody say to you, especially at graduation time, I want you to follow your dreams? You hear that all the time. But what do we do to these kids? We cut off their dreaming time. The time of sleep we're cutting off is the last chunk of the night. We're not cutting off their stage two or their slow wave sleep. We're cutting off their early morning hours. We just all lost some of our dreams uh, Sunday morning. We lost an hour of sleep. Whose idea was that? Right? Don't say Benjamin Franklin. He didn't put the law. It was, it was crazy. We lost an hour of sleep. For daylight savings, this has actually been measured. There's a part of the brain that we're going to discuss in a moment, circadian systems, that predict dawn and dusk. And it's very important to anybody with uh, any people with uh, born with any disabilities to keep track of the circadian system and make their sleep predictable to them. But the brain is trying to predict dawn and dusk. So if you normally sleep eight hours a night and you skip sleep completely, whatever reason you stay up all night, are you gonna get, will you get 16 hours the next day? No. Your brain won't let you do that. It's going to take about a week to make up that day of no sleep. And this you'll notice from, your, from when you did call overnight. Every third night was really horrible. Every fifth night was kind of a piece of cake. It wasn't so bad. It was less painful. Right? But it takes about uh, five days to make up that, that full night of no sleep. And it fluctuates among people. But they measure this in teenagers, that, that shift in daylight savings that we just had, it takes um, about five days to make up the, um, that hour of sleep, but they actually lose two and a half hours to make up that one hour of sleep because they keep waking up too low. It takes a little while, so it's a bad deal. Dreaming sleep, REM sleep, is when we're, if you have a sedentary lifestyle, many of our patients have sedentary, or many of us, many of our patients have sedentary lifestyles. If you have a sedentary lifestyle, your peak heart rate is when you're dreaming. The biggest workout your body gets is dreaming. 
That's your peak heart rate, dreaming. And this is why we think that people die in their sleep, why people get arrhythmias. Why should somebody get a heart attack sleeping instead of shoveling snow or jogging or doing something physically exerting? Sleeping is hard. Sleeping can be very hard on the body, dreaming especially. So that's when you get the arrhythmias, and that's what, that's what occurs. If you have people who are using CPAP, for example, and we'll talk about CPAP in a moment, but the machine, the CPAP, patients sometimes will tell you things, well, I slept within the beginning of the night, and I took it off later. I had it used it enough hours. They actually take it off when they need it the most. Sleep apnea is worse when you're dreaming. That's when the muscles are most relaxed. So if I have to pick somebody a time to use it, I want you to wake up with it. The more important than falling asleep with it. So we want to use them all night if they can. But sleep apnea is worse when you're dreaming. That's when you have, the, again, your biggest uh, workout. It's also when nightmares will occur. This is actually my only real sign slide, I think. Let me show it to you here. This is a coronal section through a monkey's brain. This is the third ventricle. The optic chiasm. Our eyes crisscross in the back of our heads. I'm sure you all know that. So in the brain, there is an actual piece of tissue that measures time. The biological clock is real. It's not a hypothetical thing. And it's, where are you going to put a clock in somebody's head? If you're going to think about where are you going to stick a clock in somebody's brain? We know what time it is based on light. So the first point in the body where information from both eyes meets, that's exactly where the clock's located. The suprachiasmatic nucleus, the optic chiasm, suprachiasmatic nucleus, part of the hypothalamus, this cluster of neurons here measures time. And the clock measures time best, be, be, based on DNA replication, and there's a cycle. And these clock genes actually got the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize. Nobel uh, Prize in Medicine, excuse me. Not the Nobel Peace Prize. The Nobel Prize in Medicine was for circadian clock genes. And this is so important. We have the same genes pretty much in fruit flies that are in humans. The same molecular system is going on. But there's something kind of interesting about this, if you think about the importance of sleep. If you look at the retina, the retina we learned is polysynaptic. Right, the rods and cones, all the synapses in there. There's an exception. 1% of the, of the cells in the, in the retina are actually have one, one, fun, one function only, to let the clock know that the, well, how much light is around. So it's a monosynaptic connection, straight from the retina, straight to the clock, right there. No other processing needed, right there. And this is so important for the animal to know whether it's daylight or nighttime, because some of us are nocturnal, some are diurnal, that you know, we live in, in the Bay Area, and a lot of our lives are dominated by real estate. If you're a neuron, where would you like to live? Right there. Best blood supply in the entire brain. Circle of Willis is right there. You can stroke out your, your ability to speak. You can stroke out your, your use of your right arm. You can't stroke this out. You have the best blood supply. What does this mean? That no matter how impaired your patient may be, the ability to reset their circadian rhythms is probably remains intact. Right? They probably, even if they have retinopathy, Depending on the type, you may be able to get some light into them and reset their rhythms. There are these circadian sleep disorders. Delayed sleep phase, I mentioned earlier, but the more common type we see in people who have disabilities are these irregular sleep wake cycle. People with sleep problems do what's logical, do what's reasonable. The reality is that sleep is a paradox, and I have a slide to mention that earlier to remind you to tell you that. If we didn't have to do it, we wouldn't do it. The more logical you are, the more analytical you are in your approach to, to your sleep, the more likely you are to screw it up. Because sleeping is counterintuitive. Logic, if I can't sleep, I should rest. That's not how it works. Logic is if I had a bad night of sleep, I should sleep in. That's not how it really works. Because that's thinking of sleep as only the amount of sleep. And I told you there's four components, amount, quality, timing, state of mind. We gotta work with all four of those components when we try to correct somebody's sleep. So variable wake-up times is what we're seeing a lot, a lot of irregular times. And especially people who are kind of, don't have great social interactions or being fed uh, on, on a continuous system, they may have some of these missing these social cues. But we can work with these systems and get people to sleep better. The nice thing about sleep problems, even if we only get the, the patient to, to sleep a little bit better, it makes a big difference to the family. When, when kids can't sleep, when an adult has trouble sleeping, I've seen this in people with Alzheimer's, for example, if that person is, is trouble sleeping poorly at night, that's when they get institutionalized. That's when it becomes an issue. So always take a moment to ask your patients, what's your motivation to go to bed? What's your motivation to get out of bed? Right? What are you doing this for? Do you want to go to sleep? 
you got to start thinking about you get to go to sleep. Not that you have to go to sleep, but you get to do it. It's actually a really cool thing to do. If you, if, you, if you provide yourself with a nice, safe, comfortable place to sleep, you get to do it. You can regulate anybody's sleep rhythm by, main, by regulating these four variables. Social interactions, exercise, light, and food. You can take a wild rat. A rat is a nocturnal animal, genetically nocturnal. By the way, we talk about melatonin later. Melatonin in our brains, elevated at night, it means get ready for sleeping. Rats have elevated melatonin in their brains at night also. Melatonin to them signals them to get busy. Night's coming, it's time to get busy. So melatonin is a signal that night's approaching. You take a nocturnal animal like a rat, all its family is nocturnal, it's meant to be nocturnal. You take that animal and put it in a cage and pretty much only give it food when the lights are on and when, the, when it's dark, you don't, you, don't, you don't provide any food. When the lights are on, you provide it with food again. What will the animal do? Initially, the animal will go hungry. It's not supposed to be eating when it's daytime. It could be attacked. It's scared. But eventually, that animal will change. You can make a nocturnal animal behave like a diurnal animal by changing the timing of its meals, which also teaches us something for our patients. You know, some of your patients, they, you know, you come in, you, how many of you have seen patients come in, you try to talk to your patients about their the tendencies and the genetic tendencies, and then the kids look at their parents and think they're screwed because they're looking at what their parents are like. Like, no. I tell them all the time, your tendencies are not your destiny. Just because your parents are a certain way does not mean you have to be that way, right? You, 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 can, you can be different. Your tendencies are not your destiny. So you can change a pattern of behavior of an animal. Somebody says, oh, I'm just a night owl. And then the parents say, well, I'm a night owl too, and his dad's a night owl, so that's just the way it's going to be, and he can't go to school, and he's got to go, uh, he has to be homeschooled. That's not really true, right? It's just a little bit harder for you to become a day person. So you can regulate typing of meal. A lot of young people, you have a, a teenager who will tell you they're going to bed at, say, 2 o'clock in the morning or something. I assure you their last meal is not 6 p.m. They're, they're eating much very late into the night. You can say, hey, you want to stay up all you like, but there's no food after 7. There's food uh, in the morning. You're going to start waking up, right? You're going to start getting up to go. You need a reason to do this. So social interactions, exercise, light, and food. We're talking, we can talk about melatonin and how to provide melatonin to children. The melatonin receptors are turned off by light. So if you're blasting light in somebody's face, you can be eating pounds of melatonin. It won't really do much for you because the receptors aren't expecting it. It's not there for it. So it has to do with timing of light also. We want to give people light first thing in the morning. So I talked to you about motivation earlier, and I talked to you about light just now. One of the things that I'll do sometimes with younger people is they, you know, they, they want to do video games and stuff like that. I say, well, how about you video game first thing in the morning? So well, I don't have enough time. He says, you do if you get up earlier, right? You can do, you can get up earlier. One of the things I like with all my patients, my adult patients especially, a very frequent question I'll ask an adult patient is, what do you do for fun? They're usually surprised by that question. I don't know if you ask that routinely. That's a routine question for me to ask a patient. What do you do for fun? Patients will brighten up and tell you all kinds of things. I had a lady that was depressed and her, her husband had died. She, uh, she'd had a stroke and now she's staying at one of her siblings' house and they all go to bed at eight, they go to bed at eight o'clock because they get up early to work so she has to go to her room early. And I said, well, what do you, what do, you do for fun? You know, what, what do you do? Because well, when I was younger, before I had my stroke, she used to work in a tomato cannery. Tomato cannery, and she had the night shift. She used to work through the night in a tomato cannery and she used to sing dur during her shift. And now she can't sing because she's gonna disturb the family. So we had this lady start singing um, mariachi music in the clinic full blast. It was kind of wonderful to hear just brighten up and change. But you'll be surprised when you ask a patient, what do you do for fun? Once you get a sense of what they do for fun, if a patient says, I do nothing for fun, then you're going to think about depression and things like that. Because, of course, depression uh, often travels with sleep problems. It's unlikely, you're unusual to find somebody who's truly depressed who does not have sleep problems. But if you ask somebody what they do for fun, then I ask them whatever it is that they say they do. It says, can you do it first thing in the morning? I want to play guitar, I want to work on this, whatever they say. Do it first thing in the morning. And if you don't do it in the morning, you can't do it until the next day. I want you to have a reason to get up, a motivation. All of you, when you woke up this morning, right, couldn't you have stayed in bed a little bit longer? <laughs> Why did you get up when you got out of bed? Because you had to. In your head, you had to. It was come here today, thank you for coming today. But you always in your own head is, I had to, right? Waking up is one thing, getting out of bed is something different. Waking up is biological. Getting out of bed is volitional. You don't really have to get out of bed, right? right? But, you, but you should, right? But waking up is one thing. Getting out of bed is something different. 
So if you control these four variables, you can get anybody to change their schedule. So when, also when you sometimes you're stuck getting a history, trying to figure out what to do, if you remember this mnemonic, self, you can use it to get your history, go through these four variables, social interactions, exercise, light, and food. And the reason I use self is because you can self-correct. You can, you can empower the teenager, the young adult, whoever's having these sleep issues, say you can fix this, this is a fixable thing. Right? So think about these four things when you talk with them, social interactions, exercise, light, and food. Let's talk about hypnotics, we've got 10 minutes left. I'm sure we can cover hypnotics in 10 minutes. This is a recent paper, uh, Oliver Bruni from Italy. Um, so you guys can pull this. Some of you probably uh, subscribe to this journal, but you can grab it. It's a recent paper. And it looked at kind of the, the sea of things we can try for insomnia. First off, there's nothing's approved in the US and Europe to treat insomnia in children. Anything you do is obviously gonna be off-label. First line treatment is behavioral, and that's a lot of what I do. When I first started, we did a lot of meds. Now, almost everything we do is behavioral first. And how they do it is a separate question. The most widely prescribed substances are antihistamines. Might as well recommend the things, but not a lot of evidence that they work. It's unusual these days to have anybody show up at your clinic who's not tried melatonin before they came to see you because it's over the counter. It's widely used, and how they use it and the timing of it is interesting. But it's thought to be a safe choice for most people. There's data with children um, with, a, with autistic spectrum disorder, pretty much any disability you can think of, child with disability you can think of, may have tried melatonin at some level. And it works for some people. Also, by the way, sleep is super sensitive to placebo effect. I'm not saying these are placebo effect. Sleep is super sensitive to placebo effect because your state of mind influences how you sleep. And you can prove this, open up any PDR and look at the package insert of any sleep aid. And you're going to see that when they do the randomized trials, the placebo group always has listed a certain percentage of hangover. Why does somebody get a hangover on a placebo? Because they think they got the active agent, they slept longer than before, and now they're waking up fuzzy because they've overslept. So all the sleep is super sensitive to placebo effects. And that's also why things stop working after a while. Benzodiazepines, they... Um, they don't recommend using them. This is the older benzodiazepines that you're familiar with. I have a second slide from this. A few studies on Zolbidem, Zoloplon, Zobaclone. I lean more towards using these medications because I have more experience with them with adults, so I use them a lot with kids if I'm going to use anything. Clonidine, often talked about. Many of you will use clonidine in your patients. It's popular in child psychiatry circles. You may inherit patients with it. But again, not a ton of data with it. They did not like tricyclic antidepressants and this one. The tricyclic antidepressant that I will sometimes use with success is uh, doxepin. That's the generic name. It has a brand name, which we won't say, at a lower dose. That you can try, and I've done that with some kids. And you can also get the generic, at, uh, it comes in tens, you can chop it in half and get a five out of it. You can do that, but they don't recommend using it. Trazodone and mirtazapine, which is, um, has another brand name you guys know, um, require more studies. But this is from this study here, and I can discuss these in more detail with you, but let's give you an overview of these. But the real issue is not the pill, it's the insomnia. That's the issue here. Right? Parents say, what are you going to give my kid? Well, what am I giving him anything? Well, why, why can't the kid sleep? Is the kid can't sleep or the kid can't sleep when you want the kid to sleep? What are we talking about? What is the situation here? Right? What's the timing here? The thought of sleeping will wake people up. That's when you know somebody's become habituated to having insomnia. If somebody says to you that they're drowsy, they're sleepy, when in the living room, they're watching TV and they're fighting sleep, they get to the bedroom and suddenly wide awake, the thought of sleeping is waking them up. They become habituated to being awake. You can only voluntarily keep yourself awake. You can't voluntarily force yourself to fall asleep. Right? If I were to look at anybody's respiratory rate here and say you're, somebody's breathing at, say, 12 breaths a minute, if I say take 12 breaths in a minute, I'll time you, you'd screw it up. You can't do it. It's an automatic thing. Once you try to do it, you can voluntarily keep yourself awake. You can't voluntarily force yourself to fall asleep. It doesn't work that way. On top of this, what's often overlooked are these circadian principles. Peak alertness for humans, and this applies to children and adults, is about two hours before you fall asleep. You're most awake before you fall asleep. You have to be. If sleeping is really the most dangerous thing we can do, and if you think of sleep in that, uh, in that framework, that sleeping is inherently dangerous, you must be able to protect yourself while you're sleeping. If you think, if you think of it that way, 
then, you understand, then it makes sense that biologically we have a surge of alertness before we fall asleep. You will notice yourself, if sleep was just a linear thing like gasoline, you'd be most awake first thing in the morning, but you're not. You're grabbing coffee. You have more alertness mid-morning. You get a drop in alertness in the afternoon. And then without catching any nap at all, you feel more awake in the evening. When you feel that slump this afternoon, you're going to blame it on your lunch. But oddly, breakfast doesn't make you sleepy, and neither does dinner. Why does lunch make you sleepy? It's not the food. It's the time of the day. Our predators are less likely to attack us when the day's at its hottest. So we get a surge of alertness at night. That's why it's so hard to go to bed early. If you have to think about what's it easier for you, for most of us, it's easier to push away sleep than to advance sleep. So if you want to regulate somebody's sleep and help somebody sleep better, any of your um, patients you're taking care of, ask the patient, ask the family, what sleep schedule would you like to have? Whatever numbers they pick, they say things, I want him to go to bed at 10, get up at 6. Okay, from now on, you get half your wish today. You get up at 6 no matter what today. But you're going to go to bed at midnight. I can't stay up that late. Yes, you can. You have insomnia. You can stay up later. You got to remind them, okay? <laughs> remind them they have insomnia, okay? But what you're going to do by that is it's going to crunch their sleep. We're going to make their sleep more efficient. And that's what we talk about. If it's sleep efficiency to us refers to the time of sleep divided by the time in bed. You want to be efficient in your sleep. Little kids are 90% or so efficient. Actually, something I should have mentioned here, and I'm going to go backwards just briefly in my time that I've left. There's something missing in this slide. I've got to fix the slide a little more. Nobody sleeps eight hours in a row. You never have, you never will. Human sleep cycle is about 90 minutes. Newborns, about 60 minutes. About every hour, all humans open their eyes, make sure everything's okay, and we go back to sleep. All of us wake up at night. You have to. If you didn't wake up, you'd be easy picking to our predators. Lions and tigers would pick us off at 3 o'clock in the morning. Waking up is normal. We have to wake up. Watch anybody sleep. I'm sure you've got a, oh, by the way, you've got a great sleep center here. My wife is a sleep doctor at UCSF, Dr. Ken Ewan. She works with Dr. David Clayman. I'll put it in that plug. That's allowed under the rules. Thank you. And you also have Dr. Gwen Church, who's a fantastic and trained with us at Stanford. So you've got some really good people up here. But if you visit their sleep lab, I'm sure you're welcome to join the, visit their sleep lab, you'll see that nobody sleeps through the night. Look at the tracings. People wake up all the time. We have to. And about 10 times per hour, we have little bursts of brain waves that feel like we're awake, that look like we're awake, the little like, three-second bursts of brain waves. It's just not long enough for you to remember it and be aware of it. But we all wake up during the night. We have to. And this explains sometimes how people are behaving in their sleep. So back to this issue of the hypnotics. This is a little bit skewed on, my, on here, but there was a recent study came out of Canada, and they looked at the quality of over-the-counter melatonin. It turned, in, in many countries, melatonin is a, a prescription item. I think in Australia and Europe, it's a prescribed pres pres uh, prescription item. But in Canada and in the U.S., it's over-the-counter. And what I learned was, if you're trying to sell something over-the-counter, you want to give it a long shelf life, because when you look at the bottles, you want to know what are you going to get. They reviewed the quality of the melatonin over the counter, and they found what, what was, on, was labeled on the bottle and was inside the bottle fluctuated by over 400%. Over 400% fluctuation. Even within the same brand, it was fluctuating over 400%. And about 25% of the samples had serotonin because melatonin breaks down into serotonin. So you may be giving some of your patients SSRIs and things, and also giving them melatonin, you may be giving them an extra boost of serotonin. Just know that, that um, the quality of the over-counter melatonin is not that good. So in Canada, the pediatric sleep people there are actually importing their melatonin from, um, from Europe, and they're talking about regulating melatonin. So they may create a black market in Canada, maybe, where they're going to be start importing or sneaking into across the border U.S. melatonin because it's going to be controlled over there. So there's going to be a flip side to this. But just keep an eye and know that what happens with melatonin. There are some brands of melatonin that seem to have better quality control. At least they market themselves that way. In this survey, the melatonin types... The melatonin um, types that had the worst variability, they were all bad in this study. The worst ones were the ones that came in, in as a gummy. Anything that was in a gummy type was, was very unpredictable how it would work. And we tend to like to use gummy stuff in kids, right? And I like taking the gummy vitamins myself. Um, and if it also was marketed as having a combination, sometimes you'll see um, melatonin with some valerian or some chamomile or some hops or magnesium, the things that were in combination, they also tend to be uh, also widely fluctuating what was on the bottle versus what was actually on the label. So don't lose sleep over that, ha ha. <laughs> the other thing I like to tell people is don't equate sedation with, with normal sleep. 
We can sedate kids a lot. We can give kids alcohol. You can, you can blackout drunk. You can get blackout drunk. Do you have a good night of sleep the next day? You have, do you wake up feeling good the next day? No. Just because you're sedating somebody does not mean you gave them a good night's sleep. And a lot of things that we're doing to our kids are sedating them. So keep, keep that in mind. We're running out of time. I want to make one last point to you about this paradoxical reaction. If we have a surge of alertness at night, you have a child with a disabilities, and you give them something that sedates them, what's going to happen is you're going to dissociate. You're going to start having intrusion of awake behavior into sleep behavior. And when this happens, the kids will freak out. They'll start hallucinating. So sometimes this paradoxical reaction is simply the wrong dose of medication at too high a dose. I've got 18 seconds. Oh, i got two minutes, go. The camera is uh, 14 seconds. So let me make a point here. When you prescribe something to a child or an adult with a disability, you cannot assume the parents are going to give them what you gave them, what you prescribed. The parents are going to warn their, oh, this thing might be too strong. Parents may feel guilty about giving the kids medication for their sleep, so they will underdose them. They'll give them half the pill to see what happens. And they want to give it early because they don't want the kid to have a hangover the next day. So now you're underdosing somebody and giving them the pill too early. When the brain expects to be awake, you underdose them, you disinhibited them, they'll start to hallucinate. They'll have intrusion of things. If I have one cocktail, I think I'm charming. If I have five cocktails, I'm asleep. So that's what's happening, right? You disinhibit these people and they start to freak out. So these paradoxical reactions that you may document or be aware of, go carefully over what they actually did. You may find the parents gave less than the recommended amount, and they also gave it earlier than you expected to. If you want to prescribe for real, make them go to bed later. That way you have the homeostatic drive working in your favor. Go to bed later and go up on the dose. The kids have uh, healthy livers for the most part. They metabolize the medication faster. So actually the, you can actually go higher on the dose if you're going to bother at all. If you're going to prescribe at all, go higher than you expect to. Don't go low. You're going to have these weird reactions in these kids. I saw it many times when I, when I was a child neurology resident. They would give us chlorohydrate to sedate the kids for procedures, and the kids would flip out because we underdosed them at the wrong time. Um, just a couple of things on sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is, is a real thing. You're going to see it all over the place. The thing to watch for in our group of kids, and our adults especially, you don't have to be overweight to have sleep apnea, but what you are going to have is a high arch palate. Look in their mouths and see if the roof of the mouth is narrower than the width of their tongue. If they stick out their tongue, you can see little crescent marks of the teeth along the edges, they probably have sleep apnea. Their tongue is going to be too wide in their mouths. Down syndrome is an obvious example of that along with hypotonia. So you see this high roof of the mouth. Because kids, when they don't sleep well, have trouble behaving, have, the first thing that happens when you don't get enough sleep is you have trouble paying attention. In the DSM-4, I know we're, we're not in the DSM-4 anymore, but this was the book that some of you are using as doorstops in your office now, okay? <laughs> That book said specifically for attention deficit disorder that they had physical features such as high arch palates, which I'm telling you is a physical finding for sleep apnea. So there's no doubt that there's some people out there, probably college students now, who are diagnosed as ADD as kids who actually had sleep disorders. By the way, CPAP has never been better. If you, somebody, see, we're, when we look back on our, our field, we're going to say this is the golden era of CPAP. It's just never been better than it is now. The machines are quieter, smaller, lighter. There are pocket-sized CPAP machines now. Pocket-sized CPAP machines are available. It's gotten a lot, lot better. Just because somebody couldn't try it, use it before, doesn't mean you shouldn't try it now, because it's just gotten a lot better. This is my last point I was going to make to you, and um, this is our conclusion. Thank you so much for listening, guys.